I, I'm going to pres uh, make a, a short uh, presentation of you, and later I, I give you the, the words, okay? Okay, fine. Well, uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much, Piet, uh, again, for accepting our invitation for this lecture. We are so glad and grateful to have you here in, in our class um, at the Tel University this afternoon. Um, well, Piet uh, Ecker uh, was born in 1968 in Mumbai, India. And he has studied architecture at ETA Zurich and where he graduated uh, with honorable mention in 1994, and he studied also in Columbia University, she is a and between 1995 and 1997, he works at OMA, and, and later in 2001, he uh, founded E2A, uh, Ecker, Ecker Architects with uh, Win Ecker. Uh, yet, uh, has taught in several uh, universities in, in Europe and abroad. And since 2020, he, he has been appointed a full professor uh, at the uh, Faculty of Architecture and Civil Engineering at Dortmund in, in Germany. Um, the, the work of E2A is the, the great interest and inspiration for us. We, because it develops a type of architectural practice that combines a reflective and critical thinking as it participates in the professional, cultural, and academic fields. Uh, its approximation to the project from the structural conception as part of the essential designs of projects is very close to our own practice in the workshop. So uh, his work is a relevant case of study and inspiration for us. Uh, well, uh, once again, it's very nice for us to have uh, the opportunity to, to, to listen to you uh, today. Uh, in the first part of the, of the course, of the workshop, we have uh, redrawing some several uh, building some uh, modern uh, architecture and some contemporary architecture and uh, we have selected uh, two or three works of your office to to redraw so uh, we we have studied and the students have a, a, a really an, an approximation to to your work here in the in the university so bueno, thank you very much again and uh, um, thank you, Ignacio, for this charming introduction. Um, I'm about to. Uh, you should, I think, allow me to share my screen. I think uh, because uh, it's still blocked. <laughs> so oh. maybe we, yes. Now I can do this. I hope that you will see my screen here. You see my screen? Yes, it's okay. It's good. Okay, good. Uh, I um, I would like to do a talk uh, on on the issue of bigness and what uh, bigness can deliver. I've been told that your class is currently observing a larger scale project or designing also projects in the context of um, the deep plan. Um, so I would like to kind of, let's say, um, accumulate a number of reflections regarding the big scale, what the big scale can really offer and what it can really produce. Um, and of course, not every project that I'm going to show will be dealing explicitly with the issue about the big plan, but maybe the scale or the big scale as an operational size and as a strategic tactical operation uh, might give you maybe some insight or a, 
a, a point uh, to discuss uh, after the lecture, uh, some of your experiences uh, uh, cross-reference with ours. So um, when we talk about uh, big scale operation, uh, we um, talk also how a big project uh, can become in fact uh, contextual or how a big project that uh, is being driven by large quantities can be injected or can be organized uh, in a way that some specificity can actually engage the large quantity of normality. I've been also told that in that context or exercise or design project you are designing, uh, there is a kind of a reflection on the generic, but of course a generic issue uh, also implies uh, what uh, or how something can engage exactly this um, condition. And I think within this realm of what really makes a project specific and how much energy or how much specificity you have to imply to do so, um, I think I, I will try to uh, give you a range of projects that um, yeah, I mean, that, that uh, sort of uh, tries to find an interpretation. Uh, so regardless of, or the fact that a large project uh, is being dealt with doesn't mean that the project is not contextual or doesn't mean that the specificity or the making of uh, uh, an architectural issue is not relevant. Uh, but what it, what it kind of uh, implies almost is that you have to operate on different scales or you have to operate on different uh, issues uh, regarding um, the criteria that that engages architecture. So, so I'm, I'm exactly intent now to speak about these moments of how a big, large operation um, can be engaged or can be made specific, so to speak. And and there are a few topics that that I will uh, like to address with the, that comes along with the scale. One is kind of an issue that the bigger the projects uh, get, the more they become infrastructural. Or you could say the infrastructural program will become more and increasingly important uh, relative to its, uh, let's say, platform or its offer of how a building uh, can be activated with a normal program or a, a feeling program. So inf the infrastructural program of a large scale operation is a, is a fundamental phenomena that's related to scale. And um, we start with our journey today in, in, um, uh, in the northern part of Germany, which is Bremen, which uh, we see a, um, a drawing uh, from um, uh, from the 60s, early uh, 60s from Benish, uh, which was an important architect at the time and in Germany, uh, which was responsible for the master plan of this university. It's a campus of the Freie Universität Bremen and this Freie Free University was in the 60s, a kind of a new program that was related to creating access to education for free for everyone. So, there was a kind of an explicit antithesis of how an university, an university, an university was being organized and um, uh, related to uh, a public uh, responsibility of education versus the, let's say, established faculties or established universities at the time in Germany. So it was um, the early 60s. There were, it was a time of multiple uh, foundings of new universities in, in Germany, and this um, um, was one of them. And this, this master planning was, was described, and that was very interesting, um, with a very, a very big infrastructural idea. So what you see is basically nothing else than a kind of a mega structure, an infrastructural path that sort of crosses the entire area. And uh, you see the early models of, of this uh, large operation. Um, it was a, an idea that uh, this, this uh, campus basically was based on a modularity, on a grid, uh, and uh, creating a kind of continuous available space to be occupied. So it was a kind of a modular concept. And 
found this image very interesting because you you guys are also dealing with the issue about generic. I mean, this was pure generic. So they had a module, they had a, a module that they repeated all over the grid uh, of this large megastructure campus. And almost every faculty or almost every uh, branch of the university had this kind of same setup of squatting or using uh, spaces that were all described with the, with the, with the same uh, profile, so to speak. And what, what um, and you see also some of these early sketches uh, um, and this kind of vertical layering of the campus, which we also know from the EPFL in, in Switzerland, so the ETH in the, in the French speaking uh, uh, part, which is also yeah, very yeah, much. Can you please switch off your microphone? Yeah, uh, yeah. So, yeah. I wanted to talk with you this question. Maybe, maybe you should pin and uh, yeah. Okay. So thanks. Um, so it's easier for me if everyone has a, a muted uh, microphone because uh, background is sometimes disturbing. So what what I'm trying to say is like. The infrastructural effort is very much in, in inscribed into these uh, conditions of um, the campus and the, the, the early conception of how the campus was being conceived. And um, a few images of these generic buildings, uh, which, uh, by the way, are very deep buildings that have a kind of a continuous structural grade. And what was very surprising is that uh, the quasi condition of the generic that was driven by the idea that its flexibility could be used in any direction wasn't flexible at all in the sense of housing really different operational uh, programs and usages. And so this early uh, analysis of the of the campus uh, led to this competition or this work that we then won and which are now uh, um, uh, uh, which we work now on on its realization, which is a huge building basically uh, that exactly does the opposite of the generic in the sense or that sort of counter react this endless um, modularity of buildings that are quasi different but always uh, are driven from the same module and from the same genetic material uh, in order to house extra program in order to house all these activities that you cannot house in the generic that you cannot house in the regular grid system of the existing university so it's a it's a project basically that has only a few levels, is 60 meter high, and is basically a convention center of the university um, that sort of encounters the, the new central uh, activity, the new arrival uh, by pu public transport means. And, and it has only a few levels uh, in order to really uh, house large scale operations. And let's look how, we uh, have done that, so it's the position in the site plan. It's a first uh, perspective, so it's a layering. That you see the high-rise conditions. You see uh, different structural devices that sort of uh, start to house uh, large span spaces. And it it and and what we find interesting is like that it's really very much linked to this. Um, uh, to this idea of an infrastructural effort. So uh, through the sheer size, uh, through the fact that you would um, organize um, large scale op uh, auditoriums, large scale meeting areas, the, the effect of this is that, that the, the architecture was very much driven by its essence to make things possible. And the essence implied large scale uh, infrastructural um, uh, devices. Uh, so it's not only how the building sort of links to the layered condition of the campus, but of course also how the vertical accessibility will be designed that, that can cope really with large quantities. And it was the 
architectural structural model which you see here so only a few levels the first level that is sort of linking to the infrastructural layer of the ground level then this is the forum then these are auditorium spaces and then on top um, we have a the seminar levels and the research levels so you can say we although it's a 60 meter high-rise building it's a very fat and deep plan so to speak uh, there are only a few levels so to speak um, to to design and every everything that is uh, being occupied inside, everything that's being related to program almost has the scale or the operational idea of furniture that um, will be placed inside. And uh, this is our um, analysis of our structural engineer, Schneitzer Puskas, that uh, have um, uh, designed uh, the analysis while uh, the architectural model uh, expresses it, the exploration of spaces, the structural engineers uh, express basically the capabilities and performances of the structural devices that have been in, um, in, um, introduced to the system. And you see this is there are only a few actual decisive levels that uh, makes this building um, specific. So um, to look at now into the process, and this is uh, the hypothesis that what, what really supersedes and becomes a kind of a major criteria of the design is how you deal with the issue about infrastructure uh, on this operational. So from once, from the left, uh, you're creating a, a volume uh, that can house the, the program. You, the, the, you, you basically... Um, um, uh, develop the, the structural regime from it and you see uh, the way this structural regime works with a kind of a large back site and with two individual cores uh, in which uh, space frames are being organized. And then from this level, you see how the back side of the building becomes a very specific demand. Um, and this demand is kind of related to the specificity of rescuing a public building. That means like the more people you have, the more the rescue routes become a kind of a really re uh, relevant issue about um, to secure the exit of large gatherings of, of, of people. And of course, at the last point is also how the verticality is really um, um, organized. Now, if we talk about infrastructure, this is a scheme, how the rescue routes, uh, the emergency route and the fire exit has to be dimensioned. And you see that within the first uh, level of um, the yellow, so to speak, which is sort of the rescue route of the total height of the building. And it kind of includes all the offices and the seminar spaces, which you have seen in, um, in the structural model. And then if it gets a kind of a, a lila color, and um, we add the demand of flights and the demand of dimensions, and you see how big we talk, big time we talk. So these are the flight dimensions. So three times uh, 240 was the base flight just to include one of these large uh, auditoriums. And if you then would include another auditorium vertically, um, you see how the, the, the rescue route is basically accumulating almost a kind of a Cascadian condition from a slim top exit route, how this uh, uh, grows basically into a kind of a massive dimension. Now, how, how to translate this diagram into an architecture issue is maybe a, a nice or interesting uh, uh, um, um, point of, of, of uh, an example, so to speak, how to turn a specific demand into an architectural agenda. And you see basically exactly the same diagram now, uh, which uh, becomes a three-dimensional exit route, how a singular strategy of the yellow, which is the minimal exit routes from the top, will be joined uh, with another layer with, a, with an increase uh, uh, um, of uh, extra exits uh, and accessibilities that then gets increased again with the red layer. So it's just a kind of a, a growing structure, so to speak. And we find this interesting because it exemplifies the idea how architecture, logistics and infrastructure now becomes a kind of an, a merger uh, in order to uh, 
um, enlighten, so to speak, the, the role of architecture of, of big scale operations. So your form, your organization becomes architecture by solving these logistical issues. Now, going back into the model, you see the increasing back wall, which kind of gives you the indication about a exit route strategy that has to sort of grow throughout the building. And by doing that, you, you slim down to very performative cores in the front. And um, you see how the architecture now expresses itself. So the backside of the building is kind of weaved together with the condition of a large operational exit route strategy that um, three-dimensionally provides uh, the security of the building. And in the section, you see this, uh, how the exit or the infrastructure starts in a very thin way. And then how uh, basically in a Cascadian relation, this uh, uh, staircases or the backbone, so to speak, is increasing its capacity, the more it accumulates uh, exit, exits and uh, access uh, from the public level of all the auditoriums. The section also shows you the simplicity in a way, how core, escalator space frame and the backbone is kind of driving this as an architectural statement um, and accumulates through its vertical stacking uh, this idea of uh, simplicity into the verticality you see the plan the base plan from the forum um, so a large scale operation that sort of leaves this idea of making things possible uh, to the to the students and uh, through the through um, the university. So that means that the occupancy, the the strategy to really proclaim this space becomes a possibility uh, for the user itself, while the architecture is basically operating on a different level uh, of a kind of coping the infrastructural program to house an auditorium with more than 1,000 people uh, in a stacked condition. Um, and, um, and therefore, uh, kind of enlightens this kind of relation. So large operation, this is the hypothesis, links to a kind of demand of very specific uh, specificities of infrastructural and turning this into a relation of, to determine the space to, um, to um, uh, create a specificity, a, spe a special solution, so to speak, that can cope with these criterions, criterion, um, uh, can really deliver uh, an example how, how uh, large operations um, become very specific. Now, one, one other issue uh, that comes along with, with large scales is that program is very relative. So you can also say that large scale operations often are related to mixed use of program, which is not, which to take that literal is very much related to anything goes. That means like you're making a building and uh, your program can be anything in it. And how do you deal with this? And how do you react to this? And what is the architectural strategy? Because you cannot base your architectural strategy specifically on a program, but in, in the opposite, you almost have to do an architecture that is independent of programs. So this example of work, which we are quickly flying through here or mm -hmm. uh, trying, trying to discuss is, is exactly uh, designed in this context to, to uh, deal uh, with a mixed use program, which you cannot really base as an architectural issue. Oh. And, um, we are um, at the industrial side of Zurich. Um, it's a kind of a conversion area of uh, former uh, large infrastructural buildings, but also back offices of well-known Swiss banks. So it's a kind of a mixture between back office and infrastructure and the, the site, uh, the way we found it at the time is a kind of more driven by a rare or dirty realism, which almost has evaporated in the context of Zurich because uh, the, the city has, has been so much polished up or cleaned out, so to speak, that these kind of informal spaces would hardly exist anymore. Um, and this was the program. And if we talk about mixed use, this is a program, it's a program analysis. Um, 
and a program that is very much uh, driven by or, or given by the client. So it's not necessarily our invention, but it kind of tries to assess the, the fact that the client uh, uh, was, uh, was about to uh, create a large uh, headquarter for himself, but at the same time uh, wanted to kind of uh, operate uh, a palliative care system, which is sort of a, a health care center for um, caring for, for, for people that are about to die. So it's just a kind of very delicate process of, um, of a care. Uh, a station or of a care uh, institution and then uh, they wanted to combine this with a business hotel you have to imagine so you have business people regular people that come in every day and go out at the same time you have people dying in the whole house and then you have office space of people that on an every or everyday base work there and come and then there's um, some more uh, uh, healthcare uh, uh, services, uh, but also a daycare with kids that uh, in the amount of 85 uh, kids in the house, then it's a conference center, then a daily restaurant, a cantina for all the employees, but also a public restaurant on ground level. Um, so you see, you could, you could in a way add up and say, like, what else? Or can we do something more? And, and, and in a sense, we, we realized that by analyzing all the functional relationships uh, from one to another, that the only hope was to make an architecture that was completely independent of the program. And this was a solution that uh, was a, it's not a deep plan, but it's not the opposite, it's a slap, basically, a slap building with an eccentric core and a, and a retaining wall acting as a facade um, with a target that uh, anything in between can be, can be housed, can be organized, can be made possible. So it was a kind of a strategic plan to, to deal with a load bearing concept of a core and a facade and with a lot of liberty in between. Uh, slab building, large high rise for a Zurich scale, and this was the project, the beginning. So it's a core and it's a facade, and anything in between can happen, so to speak. So, um, and I'm showing this example because the larger the project is, the more it needs to make itself independent from the program. And I find this a very important. Uh, um, message in the sense that you do in fact uh, are, are you you're really able to design a project that let's say is not based on a programmatic issue but it's really uh, dealing with the making of a facade and is making of, and the making of a core to enabling any any potential program in between and this was how we firstly delivered the project so it's a kind of, you see, it's basically a raw building with a very uh, high degree of regularity and accessibility for any kind of program set into an urban context with an underground and with a rising um, slab of 40 meters height. And we built this in a very, in a very rigorous manner. So in, it's a speak, uh, using precast elements as structural elements, so not not an in situ condition, but precast elements, which you could stack like a Lego concept on top of each other. So building the building very fast. Um, here you see this. And uh, creating basically um, a condition that everything we built on the raw scale was definite, was not to be cladded, was not to be um, covered with anything, but was sort of was supposed to be um, the end status uh, and uh, um, sort of symbolizing a kind of a, a condition that now everything that will be built in between would have to address this end status of rawness. And we will see how this turned out. And we, we developed a modular window uh, that sort of uh, sits on every opening of the facade, a window which was a slider. Um, um, that uh, um, was basically placed on the outside uh, from this double layered concrete building and could slide and uh, open um, 65 centimeters uh, and therefore could activate the facade um, uh, the way a, a potential uh, user would interfere in the, the system. <coughs> so I'm going a bit quicker. This was about the construction, but maybe this is not so important. But what we like is so to be 
to in in this large operation to to generate a very a rigorous operation, very stiff, so to speak, and, and, and introducing a playfulness that sort of allows people to interfere in a system. So, so to say, to establish an order, which, which uh, then uh, gets encountered by all kinds of different users. Um, so the building is, is very stoic, is very calm in this neighborhood um, and uh, kind of activates now itself through individual operational conditions of opening windows uh, and uh, of different time lags, so to speak, when user are um, uh, showing, let's say, their usability of the building at the facade. It can be very individual or it can be as a corporation as well. So um, what, what we really like about this to, to enhance now an, an architecture that can be both corporate office, healthcare, business hotel, uh, palliative, and you, you just quickly run through how the plan is always adapting, so to speak, this is the office layer, and this is the healthcare clinic, the palliative clinic, and then this was the business hotel. So you see, basically, as in bills, you can imagine almost everything. Now you could go on and go on with this. And just a sequence of images shows you how we organize this as a method so to speak, to design the building, what should always be remaining, what should always be the exposed rawness and how the filling, uh, the different work, different material, different sensuality to encounter. So you see this was the business hotel um, with their rooms, the separations in wo with wood, but you always see the same sort of perimeter system, the same ceiling, the same joinery, the same structural concept, but every time in a different use, every time in a different context, the lounge, the suites, the individual hotel rooms, this is our own office, uh, the end we build our own office in there, so office operational office in the same context then the palliative care so people where people choose these kind of conditions where they are also able to die the daycare system so uh, exactly the opposite uh, where young humans start their lives or are also um, helped and serviced uh, during the day and they sit uh, fundamentally different in the window than an adult and so on. So different scales of taking place of this at the conference center, the daily restaurant. So in the end, and what is interesting, the large scale accumulates basically a number of programs which you as an architect cannot really rely on. But if you find a in, and, and, and a tool basically to liberate yourself from the program, you can basically relate this liberty to the user. And in the end, it, the whole project looks like a Robert Altman. So it's a, it's a kind of a simulation of the shortcuts of his, of his um, like his movie, where say the simultaneous procedures of life of, of care, of office, or working late, or staying over uh, are, are being expressed. And, and this in itself creates an own sense of urbanity, an own sense of um, playfulness that is taking place in a very rigorous architecture. So uh, we, we thought that this was a very adequate response to the genericness of mixed use or the the, the loss of the relevance of program. Um, so I would also like about to talk about the specificity of the deep plan. Just making deep plans is today is not enough. It's maybe also showing you the dilemma of the university project that I have showed you that the idea of making large plan operations with modular condition with the same grid or something, that, that were mostly designed in a context of the, uh, a, a realm of flexibility in the end aren't flexible at all uh, or aren't not really, uh, are not really able to house, uh, let's say, mm, uh, specific uh, usages versus normal usages. And I think this lack uh, 
is a kind of a, an issue that you should address in your design or in your strategy to really encounter the role of the deep plan. Now, let's look at an example that we have done, and it's a deep plan in the context of education. And it's basically in a context uh, of an old school to build a large uh, operational uh, implementation of a new school that sort of is adjacent to the old school. And the, the operation is basically how to marry a, a, a large sporting center with a school on top of it. And of course, the reason why we marry it, it's the, it's the contextual condition is the narrowness and the shortage of space um, that leads us to, to the strategy to, to, to create a large uh, on the ground sport facility in which we basically combine this effort with, this, with a plan of school. And, and of course, what I'm trying to make the point here is how do you design a school that because you combine it with a large operational sport facility, how do you turn this huge deep plan into an architectural venture or into an architectural issue? This, uh, which I'm uh, trying to uh, I show you in this project. So you see the concept model, a structural model that sort of is nothing else than a space frame, a three-dimensional space frame that now sits here on the table. But this space frame's target is to bridge a large uh, underground uh, hall, uh, sporting hall, um, and that creates the, the resulting dimension uh, from above ground. So you see, this is the underground hall, a triple hall, which you have three individual halls, but you can unify them. And so it's all this machinery, basically, of sport facilities that we have to squeeze in the underground between the two buildings. And you see this, the size. So it's, you see, this is the ground level. So basically, the entire operation is dicked into the uh, ground. And you see the space frames that go uh, uh, across they give us the basic dimension of the upcoming school that sits on top of this structure. And you see this, this was the plan of the ground level. Uh, so there was a deciding space, whether you go down to the sports center or you go up here to the school. And this is exactly the moment. You see this space in between. So there was basically the, the whole ground level, which is the structural regime to create light for the large, uh, uh, sport facilities and at the same time um, creating the base structure for the new school on top. And this is a plan which you see here. I don't know if you can get rid of this. Uh, no, not really. <coughs> um, no, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, and and what, what, we, what we wanted to kind of um, use is to take advantage of the deep and the, the deep conditions of, of, this, uh, of this arrangement, because if you would not combine with the, with the sporting facility, you would not come up to a solution like that. But um, so to use a classroom uh, perpendicular to, to the outer facade, so exactly the other way, which you would normally um, house a, a classroom to the facade, so um, the short facade, and then to, in, to, to really explore the possibilities three-dimensionally of um, a roof that can sort of span this big plan that uh, creates a lighting condition um, that is adjacent. This was basically our concept or this, the section model, which you see, it's a kind of very specific roof condition that can house the classroom that uh, creates a, a two-sided lighting condition, so from the perimeter and from the skylight, but at the same time, in the next day, to create a lighting system to the corridor system, to the inner area, to this area of our uh, meeting and uh, of our, let's say, educational landscape. So it's a double-sided condition that sort of answers the brief of how to engage the deep plan. And you see how this works. So this was the corridor, this was the classroom. Um, so it's a kind of exactly this double-sided condition of creating the specificity of the deep plan as an issue to create a very specific interpretation of a, a school that takes advantage from, from this. And you see in section, in the sequential order of the section, how, uh, let's say, almost like a normal pitch condition are, are uh, resulting from this and how now the same pitch is creating 
uh, side lights, shed lights, shed roofs, uh, in order to introduce uh, lights in different directions. So the deep plan, so to speak, create a kind of a demand on the specificity how to address this depth of space in terms of architectural ingenuity, because otherwise you would end up in a useless condition in the center. So if you really engage the, the, the issue about the deep plan, you have to kind of react on a typological level um, to engage the possibilities of a continuous deep space. And that's what we're trying to do here. So you see this as a consequence to take advantage of uh, this large span, so to speak, of spaces that um, creating almost a kind of a pavilion or a con continuous uh, school as a model, as a, as a pavilion on top of a large structure. You see how this turned out in the end. So it's a kind of a continuous plan, a continuous transparency that takes advantage of the possibility to unify different rooms or to separate them or to relate them in any direction in this uh, uh, context. Now, what, what another issue about large scale operation is the role of cores because the core is uh, um, influencing your architecture so tremendously that so uh, all, all though, so let's say the core and the shell basically is one of the kind of key driver of, of um, an, um, a large space arrangement or a big scale architecture. In this case, uh, we, I, I'd like to show an example where the explicit abandons of a core so a coreless space, so to speak, was conceived in order to give a client the possibility to take advantage of a deep span or a, deep, a, a space with great depth in that sense um, to organize uh, himself uh, on this. And it's a, it's, a, it's a press building in Berlin at the Friedrichstraße. You see, this is Daniel Liebeskind's Jewish Museum. And uh, we basically operating here at the tip of this public garden. This is John Haydock's famous uh, tower building in uh, Berlin. It's a kind of a bad photography for it, but it kind of gives you the impression of the former uh, area of the market area of the old uh, Western Berlin area. So this was the, the site that we have found. And this was our client. So a kind of a press agency, a press, a newspaper uh, agency that sort of grew over years from a very informal condition to a, a very successful uh, press and media house in the landscape of, of, of Berlin. And this is how we find the, the, the working conditions at the time. So um, in, a, in a way, uh, surprisingly chaotic. But of course, if you would really look carefully uh, into it, there is nothing about chaos. There's just uh, something about density, but it was a kind of a very careful stacking of an omnipresent print uh, um, uh, printing house that uh, uh, was was, was uh, organized here. So, and we re react to this condition uh, in the sense of creating a now shell. A, a facade that sort of would facilitate an interior that would be given as a platform to the client uh, so that the client can create its own uh, strategy of occupancy, its own usability with it. So it was a kind of a deal making process that the architecture has taken place at the edge while the depth uh, of the space uh, was uh, given to the client to reformulate himself uh, um, uh, the benefit of, uh, of a new working condition. So it's a structural regime basically that stiffs out the entire building through its um, uh, diaphragma of, of a structure which basically stiffs out the entire building which makes the building very transparent but doesn't need a core so to speak to stiff out the building. So it was here you see the structural device um, so a very stiff perimeter with uh, uh, a beam slab that um, could really uh, organize the spans of 13 and a half meters so with a large depth in space that um, basically was the reaction of our side to 
our understanding of order and chaos uh, so that um, the, the client could, could really take the, a, an explicit advantage of a new liberty, of a new freedom to really engage this as a benefit of a deep plan. Um, so the deep plan here gets enhanced by, by a condition that there is no core in the center um, and therefore uh, it, it, it kind of uh, prevents the condition, the classic condition of a, of a, a perimeter condition and a central nucleus. So, so since we prevented this, the building has a different disposable uh, surface to offer. And of course, the entire architectural project sort of is being related to exactly this issue, how to create now an architecture that sort of fortifies the edges and fortifies uh, the perimeter in order to el en enhance a freedom in the inside um, uh, that can be organized, used uh, by the client in any direction. So it's like two projects at the same time, the architect sort of creating the specificity of this device and the liberty to the client and the client basically vice versa works in on its own specificities how to occupy this new liberty these new uh, deep plans so to speak and this is how they did it and uh, so it's a kind of a, a press agency which you can say that where where um, any collected furnitures or any system and environments uh, uh, can be housed and uh, can be made possible. So it's not an idea of exclusion, but it's an uh, idea of enhancing and integrating uh, differences of occupancies of usages um, and uh, therefore uh, can sort of house uh, all kinds of uh, demands um, in the, in, in, um, as a kind of an offer um, of, of, the, of an architecture that uh, includes basically the process of the client, their wishes. This is a client's meeting on the staircase of the new building. This is how we gave over the building, um, the conference center, the restaurant. Um, again, you see like the, the concentration of how a building can enable its offer. Uh, uh, it's sort of uh, how it can provoke the, the process of abbreviation uh, of, of uh, occupancies um, of the client. This is how the client then today uses the building. And, uh, uh, and, and um, a structure, basically, an architecture that uh, formulates only, let's say, one meter 50 from the perimeter. The balconies that go, go along with the structural device, they create basically this intense network of an outer facade that enables the, the, the building to, to integrate itself into the context, to become a kind of very contextual re, uh, related uh, um, architectural uh, concept at the same time, liberating its entire inner configuration um, for a new purpose. Now, large scale is also uh, um, en encountered uh, to the question, what does a large scale offer as an added value or as an extra program. And I'm saying this because if you do a large project in the city, you have a, you have a really uh, a, a, a specific responsibility and a building sort of has to offer something more than um, a regular building or a normal building or a normal size building. So by the sheer issue of extra size, you have to answer um, and, uh, and you have to also address the issue of what uh, it can add as a value of what it can offer as an extra program. And this building is um, similar to the previous one also in Berlin. It's, it's a very famous edge condition of the tier garden, which is the zoo of Berlin. And it's the edge of the western, the city west, which was um, an important, um, which is an important quarter because it was the uh, one of the kind of central conditions of the, in the in the post-war uh, period of Berlin uh, of West Berlin at the same uh, at the time, and this was the building that was conceived in the early 50s, which is basically this entire ensemble here, this framing building which you see white uh, toned here, 
and um, and this this building is called the Bikini Ensemble uh, because they invented in effectively the bikini uh, here. And what is really the bizarre uh, element is that this building has an empty level, and you see this here. Um, and they use this empty level uh, for organizing shows and the building housed the textile industry, a design factory, a design area where they uh, um, created uh, a new fashion uh, and they uh, made their, their tests and their catwalk and their public shows on this intermediate level. Um, so, um, and it's a kind of very historically, very, very charged space because it's right next to the Gedächtniskirche, which is a kind of world-class architecture uh, from Egon Eiermann, which sort of uh, renovated the ruin um, um, of the Kaiser Wilhelm Church. Um, so it, it's a kind of a historic, uh, very important area, as you see how in 55, the architects spanned really the Breitscheidplatz this is the Bikini Ensemble. And we're dealing about this head building here, which is this high rise building. Um, and uh, this is the current condition of it. It's a very bad status. It's been emptied out because it has lost its structural stability. Um, so it has to, had to be closed down. And um, what we introduced as a, as, a, as a renewal process is kind of to learn from this empty levels and to kind of introduce a new scale, a new size, a new big project that sort of enhances the uh, increased scale of the city west on one side, but on the other side, find its own sense of interpretation of that bizarre empty level, which makes basically the building, although for six, it, it, its size makes the building very specific. You see this in the urban model. So to, to kind of introduce at 40 meters over the, the city ground, a public agenda and public space, a slit, so to speak, um, that uh, enhances this uh, frontal condition at Bahnhof Zoo, which is basically um, the, the, the station of uh, this, the, the city west. Uh, you see the, the framing of zoo in the north. And this was one of the early Montarsa from the Kantstrasse. You see how a large project now is being introduced that sort of drives its iconic quality by its specificity of one level. So you can say um, the importance of the building is being dealt with one level while the other levels are uh, generic or while the other levels are relatively normal in their sense of attention or in their sense of importance. And you see, this was our answer to the structural idea of it. We, we, we uh, made a, a special level by introducing a crisscross of the forces, which means like the, the, the perimeter for, uh, uh, structural device here uh, uh, picks up uh, more or less the half of the load uh, uh, in, in, in comparison to the central. And so by using a splitter here, we, we could basically introduce the reduced forces or the, 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 um, the forces that are less intense, uh, we deviate them into the center and we combine them with the forces that are much more, um, let's say, uh, much larger because they pick up the full dimension of uh, the slab uh, that they hold. And uh, here on that side, of course, vice versa. So this crisscross becomes a kind of an operational, a structural uh, uh, operational to end up with more or less equal side uh, forces uh, on these structural lines. You see, this is the structural analysis of it. So here there's a very reduced force while here the pickup of the columns is, is much greater and kind of the crisscross sort of counter balance this with a, with a target that at the end of, at the, at the PLOT on the ground level, we have almost the equal conditions on both sides, which facilitates the grounding and the, the foundation of the building, which in Berlin, building in sand is a kind of fundamental issue. So, so to turn this structural device into the specificity of a space, this is the diagram, to kind of create this crisscross or this operational, structural operational idea into the bizarreness 
of one layer or one level that sort of activates its importance, its omnipresent important importance towards all the rest of the building, which maybe is then less important, more generic, normal, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it gives you a kind of a imagination of, um, with, of to a brief. If we are able to with to 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 activate or to to make a building specific with only ten percent or eight percent of the effective program versus the rest of the 90 or the 92 percent that sort of becomes a classic office building for a classic uh, global uh, consultancy uh, firm so so there's there's less capital or there's less profit from from the specificity of the normal versus this element that sort of introduce an iconic uh, relation and this this specificity creates basically a contextual relationship um, to uh, an architecture of the post-war modernity in the in the rise of um, the young German uh, democracy after the Second World War. So it, it creates this kind of affinity. It creates this kind of similarity, but at the same time also a quite radical prioritization of how to make us normal or how to make a large building at one point very specific very bizarre or very very unique so to speak um, and you see this um, expression sort of links to the idea of this myth of of, of berlin um, the relation of of space to to its own city to create this extra level that crisscross level, that public level for everyone, 40 meters over ground, um, with, with its own expression and domination of specific architecture that uh, is being encountered in exactly one layer, in exactly one level. Um, and to conclude this project with, with a kind of a blur, uh, it's an image that we simulate almost a photography of Sugimoto that has said that the real iconography of architecture is being described by the blur or the capacity to, to supersede the blur. And we found that a very interesting test because you still see the iconic uh, ruin of the Second World War that Egon Ironman turned into a masterpiece. And at the same time, in this historically loaded context, that an iconic um, incision or an iconic decision for a, a formal um, um, ambition of a large project can be reckoned uh, in the blur in uh, or identified, so to speak, through the, the blur of, of this thing. So we, we find a very an interesting uh, debate, of course, like to, to activate this idea of iconic architecture rather than its over formal expression that is nowadays so so fashionable to create an iconic idea of an overexpressed formal aspiration rather than through its typological uh, assessment of how to create a specific condition in a generic environment. Okay, um, another, another issue about how uh, the, the, how big scale can, can address the issue of generic and specificity is this project that we are also at the moment designing. It's a very complex project and that's why I'm also calling it a complex stacking because what, what, it, what it says is it, it kind of it creates a new urban quarter uh, where, where you normally would not expect to create a quarter which is a very um, infrastructural uh, a crossroad in the center part of Switzerland in Bern at the capital of Switzerland and and the the target basically you see an impression of this side and the target basically is to create a stacked condition of different volumes of different programs so what used to be next to each other so to speak in a city is through the fact that we have a shortage of available space kind of leads to the, the conceptual uh, uh, ambition to stack program on top of each other. Uh, so a corporate office um, is being stacked up 
by, let's say, different housing programs, by different sizes of housing typologies. And this stacking basically becomes a very complex configuration. And although the individual programs have certain genericness, the stacking makes a very specific and complex relation from one to the other. So it's also an interesting fact that by rising the scale as an operational uh, 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 procedure, you, you, you basically make generic uh, um, program very specific in the fact you're creating a new neighborhood or new uh, relation through the fact that you start to combine program in a bizarre or in a new or in a in a in a in a in a, in a high density that let's say um, creates this 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 urban ensemble you can say or this this coexistence of of urban plaza level or corporate offices that sort of an, are enhanced and en enhanced with small scale housing operations that are enhanced with large scale housing operations. And so the, the sheer stacking and breakage of scale of a normal program, which, which you put into a new relation creates a chance or an opportunity to operate in a large uh, scale uh, um, environment. And, and basically it's an obligation you can only do this through the fact that you're rising the scale to its effective size, which you see that. And it's a kind of a real experiment for our office. So, so to really uh, engage the genericness of individual volumes and, and engage it through uh, its combination into an, into an uh, incredible dense environment or vis-a-vis um, -vis of different scales of of, uh, let's say, socially enhanced programs of participation uh, uh, procedures where people uh, have communal spaces, but also individual housing, but combined with corporate offices. So what used to be always split now is almost a kind of a dogmatic um, environment where everything that used to be split is being used as a large scale operation to being confronted, combined, related, uh, stacked, uh, in order to create a high degree of complexity of usages at the same time, and architecturally spoken, to open up the strategy to really create specificities in its structural devices from its, let's say, uh, socle and base environment into transit or can deliver operational condition to break scales into a kind of a new repetition of hybrid materiality that uh, can engage it. So it is a kind of, a, in a way, very interesting that it's a fact of scaling that is happening here that makes these collage or this confrontation or integration of different programs possible uh, and therefore uh, become an operative interpretation, how to engage the generic, which you see here, um, how to engage, let's say, a, a corporate office in an environment where housing, community building um, uh, is, is, is taking its direct impact of neighborhood. Uh, so you see how the building sort of X-rays uh, with a fundamental difference of program and relations and, and uses the force almost of scale, specificity and intervention to diversify its program through its scale, through its uh, dimension, you see how the structure evolves and uh, becomes more specific in different scales and, and in different demands. And the result is a kind of a intensity, or you can say also uh, an urban environment where the small is meeting the huge or where the program that uh, normally uh, was split from another uh, is almost depending on it or relating to it um, as, a, as a process of typological expressions of how buildings sit on top of each other and how relate uh, to each other architecturally, structurally, um, and a few other examples. Um, and I'm coming to the last project that sort of maybe engages in a, in a most 
uh, or in the in a, in a most straightforward similarity your brief to think about the generic or to think about the deep plan in the context of workspace, large workspace. It's a project that uh, we are designing in the moment in Berlin, in Spandau, and it kind of arises the question, what is the workspace of the future? And how is big scale operation now related to exactly this question, how workspace uh, can be engaged in the future. And I'm not talking about the relation of how much home office you guys doing and how much corporate life there is. This, this is not the issue for us. Uh, the issue here is how a large typology can uh, be merged or a, how a large uh, typological relation of space, the deep plan uh, can be engaged to really uh, create a structure and a program uh, that is fit enough to address the question of workspace in the future. And uh, also here, and I find in that sense, it's quite an interesting conclusion of my lecture is also here, you cannot really relate to program. You cannot say whether your program is an office or a laboratory or meeting space or retail space or leisure spaces or parking. But what it kind of, kind of produces is a kind of a, a, a clash, so to speak, of program, because since you are not able to influence it, since you are not even able to predict how your building is being occupied, what is interesting is that the clash of program in this hypothesis questions or, or, or provokes the question, I have to say, uh, to clash or to combine typologies uh, that then can deliver different talents, different spatial offers, that uh, uh, can provoke a simultaneous usage of different domains uh, relating to each other. Our, our uh, imagination is that, uh, and we find this image very, very much uh, describing or illustrating is that no matter if you are enhancing a uh, industrial production, pr production and engineering is taking place in the same space. And I think this is a quite an impressive uh, uh, image of, of uh, Boeing uh, that sort of uh, shows and kind of aligns the process of prototyping or the process of producing while things are even engineered. So the splitting is no longer an issue, but the merge is the guarantee or the request of the future. So um, let's say if we talk about the future of the work, then uh, it asks for merging all kinds of different constellations of process into one space, into one relation, so to speak. So as a consequence, we're dealing with a new type of campus, which is no longer a campus that is driven by block street uh, as the Baroque plan of Berlin, but is basically provoking uh, a complete uh, elimination of block and street relations and knows only two sizes, very big and very small. <clears throat> and this is the program and this is the project which you see here in our uh, uh, urban model. So it's a kind of a campus of broken uh, buildings with an enormous proximity. Um, if you go through, you see this a bit more that creates a lot of niches and porosities and every building now uh, we are designing at the moment under the premise that it's a typological combination, so to speak, of uh, different tasks and, and different uh, structural devices. So it's a combo that creates basically a new relation between uh, the perimeter and its center. When you, if you speak this in a very bold way, it's it's a every building has a deep plan and every building addresses the issue how a center and a periphery can be engaged and related to each other. So you see this in a, on a structural device, how let's say the regularity of a structure can make very specific at the center or even deviated or generated in a different sense in the center or how a core strategy uh, creates an affinity with the perimeter or how a standard uh, concrete slab construction is being uh, combined with a very light structure uh, uh, of a wood or a wood hybrid construction. So even on the structural, on the typology, on the typological uh, way, we're trying to kind of confront the issue of 
simultaneous conditions throughout a diversified material expression. And you see basically um, our, our, our master plan here, uh, where uh, there uh, is uh, simple a, simply a, a discussion how a clarified perimeter is engaging a very specific or um, uh, uh, um, or uh, yeah, is engaging a very specific central condition or the center delivers possibilities that the perimeter is never being able to deliver and vice versa. And uh, you see how all of them as deep plans are basically a discussion, a topological discussion about this exploration of depth in space. And um, you see how this is being encountered by the silhouette, because if you have a deep plan, remember the first specificity of our deep plan uh, example here on this lecture. The specificity of the roof is addressing this issue about the depths in space uh, in terms of lighting, in terms of voiding, and, uh, and, and of course, in terms of uh, extra program that, that uh, a specific roof or a specific silhouette can produce uh, in this context. And just a few examples now when we run through um, the way that core and perimeter, um, so it's a project of a super core that sort of facilitates the perimeter or a, a condition where the modularity of the perimeter uh, is being uh, encountered in the center or spanned in the center between uh, uh, the, these conditions or where passage and relation is being and conceived uh, throughout the center of a building. So basically you combine something uh, with something fundamentally different. So, so trying to kind of marry these conditions of typological behaviors or specificities throughout the entire building or the, the, the concept of perimeter versus, versus the concept of production that is uh, stacked in the center of the building. So, you could go on is yourself with this exercise in the sense of what is a perimeter uh, uh, um, uh, delivering and what is a center of a space uh, delivering in order to encounter uh, this, this program. And um, just to conclude the lecture, you see how uh, the core and the structure is playing a fundamental role in this enhancement program, how a core is relating its program performance basically to the perimeter or how a large center uh, can be juxtaposed with the normality of a perimeter or how, as you see, uh, a sort of an external relation, a passage or a diagonal relation uh, uh, can influence the regularity of the generic. Um, and so the catalog is basically nothing else than um, an, uh, a, a discussion of how a normal building or a normal structural device can be encountered related with a, a very specific constellation of a center in order to enhance processes and procedures of programming, which you cannot really influence, but enhance it where simultaneous um, processes of different activities can take place, can be in its nearness or in its own uh, neighborhood. Um, so uh, where uh, you can say uh, even the program of car parking is uh, uh, part of a typological uh, relation to uh, um, research and laboratory work. So in that sense, and I found this very interesting, the question of the brief uh, that Ignacio has maybe uh, uh, um, put forward in your studio as a hypothesis can be also answered that maybe the future of our workspace is a garage and it can attract its con sort of metamorphosis in any directions through the simultaneous uh, merge of uh, different typological uh, strategies in a building. And this maybe is a kind of conclusion uh, of this lecture regarding large scale operations. Ignacio, I give back to you.
Thank you very much. Yes. 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 You heard me. Yes, yes, I hear you. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't know if, if someone, I don't know if you can do this with this digital format of lecture, but maybe someone has a question or someone wants to kind of well, so put something forward. I don't know if you are able to do this. But. No, thank you very much. The, the presentation is, is, uh, is like a, a, a really a really precision conclusion of of the every every chance that we was uh, working at, at the studio. The, nowadays we are finishing the, the workshop. Is today is the last class for us. So your presentation was very 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 uh, great for us. Uh, no, maybe I, I I want to to make a question about the in this uh, in this relationship between the generic and the specific and in, in so, some some kind of it, it, we can see in your work some, some uh, relation with some uh, language of the middle 20th century uh, architecture, but uh, taking the, the repetition, the grid, the, the some kind of the solutions of the, uh, in, in the in the generic, and, and later you you find in, in each project the, the way to find the the specific or the way to to put in crisis the, the repetition and the generic solution, no? And how, for, you, you want, one, one question is about your relationship with the history, uh, architectural history, and, and how you uh, have, uh, have worked with it. Um, and and, and other, yeah, the other question is about in, in this relation in, between the generic and the specific is you start from the from the generic and, and, and looking for the, the place to, to to find the the point in the project to to the specific or to the or to the particular solutions or you start from the generic to a specific or, or the specific to, to generic. Okay. Um, well I think the, the first question is about the role of history. I think maybe I answered this question with a kind of an episode. My brother and me, we started very early uh, to admire the architecture of Mies and uh, also the sublime um, conditions that, that um, the architecture of Mies and uh, of, of, of this period of heroic modernity, so to speak, has, has been able to produce and we used his architecture to engage our interest in strategic thinking about uh, architecture. And we, we call this work museology. Maybe you, it's funny, it's a funny that you question me. This it just came into my mind. It's a kind of an early expression of our project. You can also look it up. The, the museology project was basically a collage or a collaging strategy, how to use um, different parts of the mission architecture in order to test a strategic access to architecture because we used at the time Mies because we were so much lovers of his architecture that his architecture was never questioned so to speak so the, the fact that you could combine different Mies architectures in a relation or in a procedure where something turned out to be to be different um, um, was basically a, a, a very simple method uh, to to use the force and the greatness of modern um, expression of architecture, but putting it into a contemporary context of a strategic um, constellation or a. Um, uh, into a process of 
how to react to, to um, a program that you have analyzed that uh, maybe works with discrepancies or with, with, with something that isn't quite that platonic as the, per the period of the modernity was. So, so we, 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 we use this as a project, project process or as a, as, a, as a tool, as a method, so to speak, in order to enhance our interest in strategic conceptions of architecture by employing actually great deals of modern architecture. So, so in order to answer your question, I think our interest in the sublimity of modernity is to put it into a relation or into a, put it into a kind of strategic uh, context uh, of speculation, how a condition A and a condition B can be put in a new relation or into a new programmatic force or into a new typological interpretation. And, and therefore uh, history becomes part of that process or of that, of that, let's say, architecture, of that architectural interest. Um, the, the second question is, is a kind of a more a process uh, question. I mean, where to start, you know? And then um, I don't know how your students have, have, have answered to the brief, and, but I find that very difficult to, to answer because sometimes you analyze a, a program, a context, a constellation that is being asked. And what is interesting is that uh, from that analysis, uh, the, the relation uh, or the, the access uh, becomes uh, more as a, or let's say motivates the process. And in that sense, it can be both. It can, it can be a start into a complete genericness, or it can start to say, how can I, interfere into something which I just have to maintain or I just have to provide or that has very, very little capacity to uh, create any specificness in architecture. So that's why I'm saying like, you can say this, the analysis of our, of our circumstance, of our brief, of our time, of our city, of our brief, of a competition or whatever, is nothing else than the search how something that might be completely normal can be encountered with something which is absolutely not normal. And this relation can start from both ends. You can, you can uh, but method, from the point of methodology, I find it much more important to, to discuss what influences normality rather than what is normality. So as a process, I would, I would, I would discuss or I would try to enhance the, fact that knowing what makes it specific makes it much more relaxing for the normal than vice versa where you try to really gain something in the normality which is not almost not worth looking at so so in that sense it is a question of of priorities it's a question of how can something which is large or generic um, deliver something that turns this normal fact of architectural expression into something very specific, into something very contextual, into something very adequate in the sense of an architectural brief. And I think the specificity is the most important methodology or the tool or priority in that process. If you don't, if you don't find it, it's very hard. You know what I mean? Okay, thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Um, um, hi. Uh, I wanted to ask you about your views on utopias, actually, because uh, through every building that you went through, there's always kind of like a, a sense of problem solving, if you might, or variable uh, connections that uh, basically build a building. And I wanted to know if there was any correlations 
between your projects and they got bigger projects if we are talking about uh, history. <laughs> um, meaning like, what world does your architecture live? That's my question. Okay, I'm not sure if I understood this correctly acoustically, but I'm, I'm trying to make it up. I think your question was, um, if the architecture is being driven as a problem problem solver, or uh, what what is the main what is the main motivation of this process? If I correctly give this, but otherwise you, maybe Ignacio can correct this question, or is it correct the question? Or uh, yeah, kind of. It's uh, more of a question. Of what what are you looking for uh, when you build your your world, I mean, your... Ah, okay, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we're looking for the specificities, like using the word of Ignacio, is if you analyze something, if you get asked for a briefing, or if you get a very classic briefing for, a, for an architectural competition or an architectural work that you want to answer, or we, we, the first question is what makes it um, um, special or where is the speciality that we are interested in and uh, you have to you have to imagine the longer you work on 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 these issues the more you relate and, 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 and understand that it, it's exact we are exactly no longer into this platonic uh, um, area or or, or 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 constellation of, of great modern architecture that we admire, uh, but we are more and more into a in, into a, exposed to 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 a, a context of volatility, of insecurity, of difficulty, of things that you might say or might discover that not everything fits together and not everything can be organized that it fits together and you can also say there there are more and more uh, this discrepancies of the contemporary culture of our society um, it's no big consensus, uh, but there are many contradictions to it and we find that the reason to enhance our discussion uh, to produce architecture in trying to discover or in, in, in trying to engineer a process to discover how we can find an answer to, to this volatility, to this insecurity. And you can say, of course, in the end, it's a problem solving strategy or did it do, to detect, to discover such a contradiction, it becomes a kind of a chance for architecture to encounter this as, as a method or as a relation um, to say this is important and maybe this is not so important. And this gives you a tool to, to develop the architecture to also say, because you have a feeling this is important and this is not important to encounter and to react and to steer your project exactly in a, in a moment, in a context that is so volatile. And you can also give something back as an added value for that, that architecture produces to, to, to those people that create the brief or ask you to do an architecture enterprise. So I think this is the great meta context, you can say, of our ambition is to, to find a process, to find an answer, to find a concept in, in such a contradicting uh, environment. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, there are a question in the chat. Maybe you, you could uh, read it. I wait for you. Where's the chat? Yeah. 
this uh, it said it say, says uh, Miss World was uh, admired in America, huge scale. What is the, the biggest challenge uh, within the topic of scale for today's Swiss architects to design outside of Europe in the USA or China? Well, we don't design at the moment in the US and we don't design in China, so I can't really answer that. But the, the, the challenge of big scale operation in Switzerland is a big one because the country is very attractive. Uh, we are in the heart of Europe and we have a very strong economical frame uh, or, or a setup and that produces a lot of immigration and a, gro a lot of growth, which a small country uh, puts it uh, uh, very quickly under stress. And uh, Switzerland has the nature of a small scale environment. And um, what is really interesting about this is that the increased request for density, that the magnetic effect of many people that come to Switzerland and therefore increasing uh, the request on size is a huge stress to the society because most of the society are not really prepared or uh, uh, are not, not necessarily willing to admit the, the rise of a new scale. Uh, we have um, quite a number of, of, of challenges where in Switzerland, for example, you can no longer extend or enlarge the buildable surface of our country. Every building operation needs to be undertaken within the boundary of the built surface of our cities and villages. And therefore you can imagine larger operations are being replaced or superimposed or related to the existing. And that is a, a very, very big uh, social challenge, so to speak, to create an acceptance of, of these procedures and um, a critical reading and a critical discussion about the change of our cities uh, through new scales, uh, through uh, new silhouettes, new high rises, new densities that, uh, let's say, have not been visible for a long period in Switzerland. So the, the, the rapid growth, the, the consequences of it, the stress on it, and the challenges that we have regarding the, the climate uh, and the challenges that we have regarding a increasing social um, um, fairness um, is are, are huge. So, so the, the let's say the 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 framework gives uh, a lot of challenges for contemporary architecture in Switzerland to address these issues: how to make size acceptable, how to integrate larger. Um, processes of densification that imply the rise of big scale operation uh, in, an, in an environment or in a mental context of uh, small scale settling. So um, you can imagine that these are big challenges for the next years to come. Um, and regardless of the scale of the country, the scale of architecture um, will will have to confront this this uh, dilemma or also this uh, difficult conditions of uh, economical attraction. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, thank, you. thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I thank you. I, I wish you all a, a very successful conclusion of the studio. I'm, I'm really curious, Ignacio, uh, at, one, at one point uh, to see the results of, of your brief, because uh, as, you, as you have realized, we're working on similar topics and the academics uh, is, of course, a great platform of exchange. And therefore, I would be curious of what your students are delivering in this brief of how to make this, the, the large operation and the large genericness at one point so specific that it can answer the contextual conditions or the challenges of a context. So I will be very curious. Uh, the best is of course to keep, to keep exchanging. And uh, yeah, this is maybe the conclusion of this evening. No? Okay.
we, we are going to send you the, the final uh, the final part of the work to, to maybe look up a, 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 a email interchange if, if you could. Okay. Well, thank so, you. so thank you and all the best. Eh? I'll see you in Buenos Aires. In, in yeah, 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 yeah. Just uh, I would love to. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Let's go next.